is eight o'clock. This is the UK Tonight. A glimmer of hope in a desperate humanitarian crisis. Today has seen the first evacuations from Gaza in more than three weeks of war. As hundreds of families wait for news of their loved ones, tonight the first British nationals have been allowed to cross the border into Egypt. They're among hundreds of foreign passport holders and injured Gazans who have made their way to safety. Tonight, we'll hear from a mother whose daughter, a teacher from Manchester, is still trapped in Gaza. Also coming up. Storm Kieran is set to batter the UK when it sweeps up from the channel tonight with risk to life warnings already in place. This, the scene in Dawlish this evening. How a toxic culture of ego and sexism played out in Downing Street during the pandemic. That's according to a top civil servant. And we'll bring you a harrowing story of survival. Sarah de la Garde was hit by two tube trains after slipping through the gap between the carriage and the platform. Now she is calling for change. All that to come and much more on The UK Tonight. British nationals have been able to leave Gaza today, crossing to safety in Egypt. They are among hundreds of people with foreign passports and dozens of injured Gazans who've been allowed to leave the territory through the Rafah crossing, which slammed shut when this war between Israel and Hamas erupted just over three weeks ago now. But not everyone who went to the border was able to leave, with the UK Foreign Office saying that crossings are expected to take place over a number of days. Our special correspondent Alex Crawford reports from Cairo and just to warn you that her report coming up does contain pictures that you may find distressing, including injuries from the aftermath of airstrikes. Rows of ambulances in Gaza carried the most critically wounded towards the first chance of escape from the hell that is happening inside the Strip. In the emergency convoy, there were 81 mainly elderly people, but some understood to be children. The breakthrough comes after frantic discussions overseen by Qatar and America, and then agreed by Egypt, Israel and Hamas. It's a chance of life for them and has led to tough choices for the medics. One doctor told us he chose 18 of his most ill patients, but he had 30 others waiting. Because most of them uh, will need uh, advanced surgery either in the uh, brain or in the spinal cord or in uh, the, the different surgeries which we don't have uh, uh, enough uh, medical supply for them. So I wish to be able to enter today and to have a good services so we can send more, uh, more uh, in injuries and more patients who will be benefited from this uh, chance. Egyptian state TV showed some of the injured, including this young boy, arriving at Arish Hospital. The evacuations came, as a Hamas official said, the more than 200 hostages being held by them were under the same threat of death and injury that Palestinians are facing, and claimed an unspecified number had already died in Israeli attacks. If you think you've seen these pictures before, think again. It's the same desperation, despair and destruction and the same refugee camp in Gaza. But Jabalia was hit for the second day in a row by Israeli airstrikes. The Israeli military says it is a stronghold of Hamas fighters. There were no official figures of injuries or the numbers killed, but there is substantial damage and many casualties. The pictures were released by Hamas, but the location has been verified by Sky News. There's no let-up to the terror and fear going on inside Gaza. No wonder then that the only escape route via the Rafah crossing into Egypt was besieged by people desperate to get to safety. Hundreds scrambled to the crossing and scoured the list of names drawn up and approved by five different governments, hoping against hope their names would be among the lucky few. About 500 names are on the list, and the UK Foreign Office says the first British nationals have crossed. The list includes a British surgeon from the Royal Liverpool University Hospital, who we spoke to. Uh, I'm waiting in, uh, at the moment, we are crossing about five kilometres from the UN uh, facility. Uh, it's very difficult to cross. They have taken one group to the uh, crossing. I'm waiting for us to be taken to the crossing. I'm not sure that about the timing here. But the list doesn't include many others who went to the crossing, including a mother from Manchester and her five children who were visiting family in Gaza. Uh, we have no electricity, the, the food, we have 
to go find each day. Uh, the water stopped, so there's no no sanitary water. There's uh, we have to go find the drinking water. Um, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. <laughs> The Egyptian authorities say the crossing will be open for a second day. That's unlikely to be enough to cope with the many desperately trying to leave. Alex Crawford, Sky News, Egypt. Well, tonight's news will bring hope to hundreds of families here in the UK who have loved ones trapped in Gaza. The Foreign Office, though, says the process of getting people out is complicated and it's likely to take a number of days. Well, I'm joined now from Manchester by Lala Ali Fatten, whose daughter has been in Gaza since this war began. Uh, Lala, good evening to you. Thank you for joining us on the UK tonight. Um, first of all, um, I'm sure you'll have been elated, in a sense, when you saw that the Rafa crossing was open to foreign nationals. Your daughter hasn't got out today, but what news has she had from the Foreign Office about when and if she may be able to, to get out? Well, she was notified of the border crossing being open today and they went and checked and unfortunately they didn't find their names on the list of those that were permitted to leave. So um, they had to um, return back. But um, they received another message today from the Foreign Office just informing them that um, tomorrow uh, they are working on um, a list of names and hopefully we're very hopeful that their names will be on tomorrow's list. Yeah, it really is watch and wait, isn't it? Because the Foreign Office has said, you know, this is likely to take days. Uh, Zainab, not on the list today, maybe tomorrow. What's the situation like that she's in now? Has she got enough food? Has she got a place to stay? Uh, the last the last week or so um, has been very, very challenging for Zainab and um, her family and her husband. Um, there's a food shortage. They've, they ran out of drinking water yesterday. I don't know if they were able to secure some today. Um, they're washing in seawater, their clothes themselves. So it's situation is really dire. It really is. And this year was the first time that Zainab visits Gaza. She, this is this is a new experience for her and she has been really affected um, psychologically. It's taken, it's taken a toll on her. And the last message I got from her is her saying, Mama, I just want to come home. And as a mum, that must be so difficult to hear because the first thing you want to do is to help your daughter to, to make her safe, to bring her home. And you, like so many people here in the UK, just have to watch and wait, you know, her fate and, and where she goes next is in the hands of, of the authorities. You must have had some really difficult conversations with her. What's communication like? Because obviously we know that electricity is scarce, generators are scarce, and those trying to keep in communication with loved ones to update them on, on what's going on to try and get them out or for them just to let you know they're safe. What's that been like over the last couple of weeks? Well, internet is very patchy, so hearing her voice, um, if I'm lucky, I hear it, you know, every other day or every two, three days. Um, she gets some message out, uh, messages out on WhatsApp um, as soon as she has a signal. So in the morning when I wake up, I'm just waiting for that first message just to, just to reassure me that, you know, they made it through the night and they're all okay. So communication has been very difficult, especially this past week when all communication lines were, were completely closed down. So that was 36 hours. I didn't know what was happening to Zainab. The bombing had increased and it was, it was like a living nightmare, to be honest, just to wait and see when I can hear from her next. Uh, well, I'm sure you're literally just waiting by the phone for that WhatsApp message or that call every moment of the day, Layla. Um, where is Zainab? We know that Nowhere in Gaza is safe right now, but what has she seen? You know, how perilous has she found her situation at times? She She's very reticent in sharing um, what she's witnessed, um, but I know she has, she's experienced a lot. They, I can hear it in her voice and she is just keeping to the main points, which is that they're okay and they ate that day and, you know, they made it through the night, but she's unwilling to share anything else. And that just makes me think she's, 
she's possibly seen scenes that she doesn't want her mother to know about. Yeah, Layla, you desperately want to protect your daughter and your daughter wanting to protect you from the worst of what she is perhaps experiencing in Gaza. Um, well, we wish you well, Layla, and we hope that Zainab is able to leave Gaza soon. As you said, she wasn't on the list today. Hopefully she'll have better news tomorrow, but we'll keep in touch with you, Layla, and we, uh, and we wish uh, Zainab and those she's with well. Thank you so much for joining us here in the UK tonight. Thank you. Now, major incidents have been declared on England's south coast and in Jersey. This is as Storm Kieran approaches. Amber warnings are in place as the storm heads towards the southwest overnight. It's going to move northeast into the morning. Last month was one of the wettest Octobers ever, and with gusts of up to 85 miles per hour in some areas, more disruption is expected. We can bring you the scene live now in Dawlish in Devon uh, this evening. Uh, that is the seafront uh, just next to the train tracks. Uh, we have seen some trains going past the waves uh, taller than those train carriages. Let's speak to our West of England correspondent, Dan Whitehead. Um, he spent the day there and uh, he sent us this report. It is a race against time to make these barriers watertight. Final preparations for Storm Kiron are underway in Exeter as the southwest of England prepares to bear the brunt. We know this is going to bring us exceptional weather. Um, we've already got um, six flood warnings out um, around Devon and Cornwall coast and we know that we are looking at probably two weeks of rain in, in 24 hours. Further down the Devon coast, it's already too late for the ship in at Cockwood. Half of the pub collapsed following heavy rain just a few days ago. There's little now that can be done to protect what's left. So this is where all the emergency equipment is kept, is it? In Dawlish, the Mayor Rosie is preparing for the worst and hoping for the best. An emergency team made up of local volunteers is on standby. We've made sure that we know who's in town, who's not on a night out, you know, to make sure we've got people who are, are ready to respond at any time over the next 48 hours, really. Winds of up to 85 miles per hour are forecast, a danger to life warning in place, with damage to buildings and homes possible. The storm is likely to bring significant travel disruption across the country, especially here in the southwest. In fact, the majority of trains going into Cornwall will not be running until at least midday on Thursday. Businesses here are used to flooding, but no one knows just how bad this will be. Tonight, this all needs to be shut. We need to shut the door, shut the gates, and then these, they get slotted in. And we've actually got a key, so they'll actually, they lock. They lock into place and nothing, no water should get in. Well, because we don't want the shop wreck, do we? It's, you know, it's a family business. In Jersey, locals are preparing for winds of up to 100 miles per hour. Islanders are being urged not to panic by supplies, but to stay at home. It's a significant storm. It's a storm that we haven't seen the likes of in, in a generation, in around 35, 36 years since 1987, when the great storm came through the islands and through the UK. For much of Thursday, the southwest, southeast in the Channel Islands will be battered by strong winds. This is the calm before the storm. Dan Whitehead, Sky News, in Dawlish, South Devon. Well, Sky correspondent Emma Birchley is in Hastings for us tonight. Tom Parmenter is in Milford-on-Sea in Hampshire. Uh, Emma, I'm going to come to you first there uh, on the coast. Uh, what's it looking like as Storm Kieran approaches? Yes, yeah, so I'm in the middle of that eastern amber wind warning that runs from the west of Portsmouth right the way up to Essex. Now, it's gusty now, but nothing compared to what is likely to come tomorrow morning around sunrise with gusts expected of over 70 miles per hour. Also, uh, really big waves, people being warned to stay away from the water's edge, and they're certainly not taking any chances with heavy rain forecast overnight. There are pumps in place that can pump 1,000 litres per second. There are tankers on standby. There are sandbags that have been given to a cluster of roads just set back from the seafront that are most vulnerable. So now it's a matter of just waiting to see exactly what happens. Thank you. Let's go to Tom in Hampshire, Milford-on-Sea. Tom, how are they preparing there? 
Well, as you can see, Sir Jane, it is already whipping up quite fiercely now from the English Channel. This is the rain just coming in. Take a look just to the side here. That's our car just 20 yards away and the rain is just lashing into the Hampshire coast tonight and they have declared a major incident in Hampshire and also on the Isle of Wight and that has triggered a number of responses. It includes help for people who are rough sleeping. It includes over 50 schools now that have closed just in and around Southampton. They're expecting major transport difficulties, surface flooding. There are alerts and warnings right along this coastline and it is really something where people are being urged to take extreme caution tomorrow. Don't go out for a walk in the woods because many trees will be up, up lifted through these horrendous conditions that we're already seeing now here in Hampshire. OK, Tom, thank you, Tom. And Emma, take care. We can actually go to Jersey now at Ashna Huranag. Touch and go as to whether we could speak to Ashna. Uh, obviously, this weather hampering communications, but I think we've got Ashna. Um, Ashna, we can just about see the wind whipping around. We can tell by your hair. Um, talk to me about what's happening there. It's, it's pitch black, but obviously Jersey, one of the areas that's going to be really affected tomorrow. Yeah, it has to be said that wild weather is already starting to batter the shorelines. Behind me, I'm actually standing on a seafront and the tide has just come in. And in a few hours, we're told, some of that water is expected to crash into the street that I'm on currently. A major incident here in the Channel Islands, but specifically in Jersey, is due to be declared at midnight tonight. Already tomorrow, we know that schools, colleges are going to be shut. All emergent, non-emergency hospital procedures and appointments have been cancelled tomorrow. It means that things like roads and bridges are so treacherous. There's a real impact on transport. You know, if the UK is going about to be hit by this storm, in the eyes of Jersey, they're already take, taking that battering. When you look at things like ferries to this island, which they rely so much on, but also flights, they have been grounded. So it feels very much like this island for the next 24 hours is going to be completely cut off. OK, Ashna, thank you. Ashna Huranag uh, on Jersey for us this evening. Um, regardless of where you are, if you're affected, stay safe. Sky meteorologist Joe Robinson is with me because those who are in the affected areas are really going to feel it tomorrow. Yep, but the right. irony is some people will look out of their windows tomorrow and go, What's all the fuss about? Exactly. No, it really is like a regional storm in the sense it's not affecting the whole of the UK. It's southern parts of Britain. That's where we're going to see the strongest winds and particularly coastal areas. Mm. That's where we're going to see those damaging and disruptive winds through, you know, the early hours of the morning and through Thursday. So conditions will be terrible and we've got the heavy rain on top of that as well. But you can see in the background here, we've got them... Um, a jet stream, strong jet stream, and that's intensifying this area of low pressure. Mm -hmm. So it's intensifying it, and we've got explosive um, cyclogenesis, and that's where you see a fall in pressure of 24 mm -hmm. millibars or more in 24 hours, and that's what we've been seeing. And it's producing these really strong winds. You can see the purples here. And um, those really strong winds are going to affect the Channel, particularly northwest France. We talked about the Channel Islands. Mm. That's where you could see gusts 100 miles per hour, perhaps even more. But for the UK itself, we're going to see Devon, Cornwall and southern coastal areas. That's where we'll see the strongest winds, potentially 85 miles per hour or more. And it's the track of the storm that's mm. important because if it moves a little bit further north, that's when we could see those stronger winds further inland. So the track is certainly um, the thing that we need to get exactly right to know exactly where the most dangerous conditions are. Okay. But there are warnings in place. Yeah, many warnings. You can see them there. OK, Joe, thank you. Uh, we will follow the progress of Storm Kieran uh, throughout the night here on Sky News and well into tomorrow. Thank you, yep. Joe. Uh, still to come on the UK tonight, the rules were broken every day. A senior official in Boris Johnson's government reveals how Covid rules were ignored in Downing Street. A threat to humanity, Elon Musk speaks to Sky News at the government's AI summit. And police are asking for help to catch a man accused of releasing live mice in McDonald's restaurants in Birmingham. I'm Martin Brunt, and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. 
My most memorable story was, and still is, the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Please, please do not hurt her. Please give our little girl back. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. For detectives, the first 48 hours after a murder are crucial in the search for clues. The public expects them to find Jill Dando's killer soon. The British detectives are planning to meet forensic experts, academics and even witch doctors. I remember the grimmest case, the Soham murders of schoolgirls Holly and Jessica. I felt I can't undo what's happened, but I can help explain it. Come Ian Huntley was arrested and charged within a fortnight of the murders. I've never murdered anyone. I've never raped anyone. What am I in jail for? The parole board has to decide if Bronson needs to be kept locked up for the safety of the public. My biggest challenge was to persuade a jail diamond thief to answer my letters. Martin Brunt, Sky News, at the Old Bailey. The five of us have made it out of the car. Welcome to Backstage, the film and TV podcast. Welcome back. You're watching the UK tonight. Here's what's coming up. We'll tell you all about the library in West London that's been forced to close because of bed bugs. And two more people have been arrested by police investigating the cutting down of the sycamore gap tree in Northumberland. But first, a top official in Boris Johnson's government has told the COVID inquiry today that coronavirus rules were broken on a daily basis in Downing Street. Helen McNamara, who was Deputy Cabinet Secretary during the pandemic, was one of the officials to be fined over illegal gatherings in Downing Street. You may remember she supplied the karaoke machine for one of them. Well, today, she accused the former Prime Minister of letting the country down by presiding over a toxic culture of arrogance and sexism. Our political correspondent Tamara Cohen reports. Boris Johnson at the start of March 2020. We do have a great plan, a plan to tackle the spread of coronavirus. Full of confidence, we heard today it was dangerously misplaced. Helen McNamara was the second most senior official in government. She told how Johnson and his team thought Britain would sail through the impending crisis. And nothing but the chief. The sort of unbelievably bullish, we're going to be great at everything approach is not a smart mentality to have inside a government meeting. Covid had by then ripped through northern Italy, pushing its hospitals to breaking point. If we could just tell people what the right and kind and proper thing to do is, people would do that. And sitting there and saying it was great and sort of laughing at the Italians was just, it just felt completely, well, it felt how it sounds. Eventually, she went into the Prime Minister's office and delivered this message, read by the inquiry's lawyer. I have come through here to the Prime Minister's office to tell you all, I think we're absolutely I think this country is heading for a disaster. As Britain went into lockdown, she claims the health secretary wasn't telling the truth. We heard about a sexist, macho culture in Boris Johnson's government, and this is one of the most senior officials saying it had huge implications. Women, she said, were not listened to or respected, and there was detachment at the top of government from the reality of many people's lives. This is an email Helen McNamara sent in April 2020, telling female colleagues the issues she thinks weren't considered. Abortion, domestic abuse, families, fertility treatment and the fact PPE did not fit women. Women whose job it was to do something were not able to do their jobs properly because they weren't having the space or being asked the right questions or being treated with the respect that they would do. She was fined for attending a gathering at the Cabinet Office during the pandemic and said it shouldn't have happened. 
but described a culture in which hundreds of ministers and officials broke the rules. By winter, Covid was again soaring. Christmas celebrations cancelled at the very last minute. Helen McNamara left government shortly afterwards. Tamara Cohen, Sky News. Well, let's take a look at some of the other stories making news in the UK tonight. And Elon Musk has called artificial intelligence one of the biggest threats to humanity. This is as he arrived in the UK today for the government's AI safety summit. World leaders, tech firms and scientists are gathering at Bletchley Park this week, the home of the Second World War codebreakers. Mr Musk issued a stark warning about AI, saying that for the very first time in history, there is going to be something on Earth that is more intelligent than humans. Elon, Elon, I'm from Sky News. Do you think AI is a threat to humanity still? <laughs> it's a risk. You can follow me. The head of the Royal Air Force has apologised. This is after an inquiry raised concerns that the Red Arrow Squadron wasn't a safe environment for women. Air Chief Marshal Sir Rich Knighton says he is appalled at what was uncovered by the inquiry, which included widespread predatory behaviour and service women forced to club together at social events to try and protect each other from drunken, unwanted advances. Two Red Arrows pilots have already been sacked because of their actions, with a further nine personnel facing disciplinary action. Police in Birmingham have released details of a man that they're looking for after live mice were thrown into McDonald's restaurants. The man has been named as Bilal Hussein, and he's accused of a number of incidents over the past two days. Another man was arrested earlier today. Well, the mice were sprayed in the colours of the Palestinian flag. It comes after pro-Palestinian activists called for protests against McDonald's over reports a restaurant in Israel donated meals to Israeli soldiers. A McDonald's spokesperson says the company is dismayed at the reports. Two more people have been arrested over the felling of the world-famous Sycamore Gap tree in Northumberland. Two men, both in their 30s, were arrested on suspicion of criminal damage yesterday. The tree, made famous by the movie Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, was cut down in September. A 16-year-old boy and a man in his 60s remain on police bail. And a library in West London has been forced to close because of bed bugs. Ealing Central Library closed its doors after bugs were found in its furnishings. A spokesperson for the local council says it plans to reopen the library tomorrow once measures have been taken to get rid of the insects. Bed bugs have been in the news repeatedly over the last month or so after an outbreak in Paris sparked fears of an infestation on this side of the channel. Apologies if you're eating your dinner. Uh, still to come on the UK tonight, uh, we'll find out why police have stopped attending mental health calls in London. And we have an amazing story of survival for you. I'm going to be joined in the studio by a woman who was hit by two London underground trains before anyone came to her aid.
Now, my next guest tonight has a quite simply extraordinary story to tell. Sarah Delagarde was on her way home in September last year when she slipped on a tube platform and fell down the gap between the edge of the platform and a London underground train. Well, no one realised what had happened and she was hit by not one, but two trains before anyone came to her aid. And Sarah now wants to make sure that that never happens to anyone else. Uh, well, she joins me in the studio now. Sarah, so good to see you tonight. Hello. Uh, this happened just a year ago, and I just remarked when you walked into the studio in the advert break, just what a remarkable cover it looks like you have made in that year. Because what happened to you was horrific and harrowing. Let's not, you know, mince words about it. Take me back to that night. You'd fallen asleep on a train. It was wet, you slipped. Pick up the story. Yes, yeah, so I slipped on a puddle on, on the platform mm -hmm. and crashed against the stationary train, fell through the gap in between the train and the platform. Um, I injured myself uh, badly enough to break a nose and my two front mm -hmm. teeth. And then the train departed and took my right arm with it. I was conscious throughout and I shouted for help and nobody heard me. And the second train came into the platform and claimed my right leg. Um, I was still conscious after that, still determined to make it home because in my mind's eye, I could see my two daughters and they were telling me, Mummy, you have to come home. What are you doing? And at that point, somebody heard me. Sarah, between you slipping between the gap and someone coming to help you, that was nearly an hour. So there were, I was on the tracks for 15 minutes before somebody raised the alarm and then it took another hour before the, the, the rescue services arrived. And there were a series of things that delayed my saving, basically. Um, I was told that switching off the power line took ages because nobody knew who to contact, so the paramedics couldn't get under the train to get me out of there. Eventually, they had me on a plastic board and shoveled me all the way up, I don't know, 30 metres of, of underneath a train carriage. Um, apparently, the staff didn't know which number to call and it took five minutes or more. To... I mean, so many avoidable mistakes and failings that TfL is allowed to happen. And I have to live with the fact now to know that it could have been just a slip and somebody could have found me and I would have gotten away with a broken nose mm -hmm. and two front teeth. So it to be different. This was late at night, you were at the end of a train line. All those circumstances led to what happened to you. I mean, you were conscious when this happened. You lost an arm and you lost a leg. I mean, the physical impact of that is evident. You're sitting here with, you know, an incredible robotic arm. The advances in medicine and technology have enabled you to carry on, carry on with your life. But the psychological impact of what you went through, I mean, just you talking through what happened to you there on the tracks, it sounds like, it sounds like something from a horror movie, if I'm quite frank, and you live through that. Can you talk to me about the impact it's had on you mentally? It obviously has a major impact, and the sad thing, it's not impacting just me, it's impacting all the people around me, especially the closest, my daughters, my husband. I mean, it's been a really, really tough year, and they, you know, there are days where everything's so dark mm -hmm. that the thoughts of thinking, why did I even survive this? I was told by doctors I should have died 10 times that night. It's a complete miracle that I survived, and I hold on to that, but I also hold on to the fact that if I survived, it was for a reason, and it is to highlight that these safety procedures that TfL think they have are not sufficient. Otherwise, I wouldn't you know, be here with these injuries. The London Tube Network is used by 2 million people every day. 16 incidents like yours happen every month, somebody ending up on the track somehow, accidents like that. Most people will have had experience of the tube network in London and you stand behind a yellow line, that gap between the tube carriage and the, and the platform. Often when you step over it, you think, oh, you know, that's pretty big. So much of your safety is on the trust of others to, be, to behave responsibly because, you know, in a packed commute, it can feel overwhelming. What do you feel needs to be done to make travel safer? Well, I did get that question. Um, 
you know, quite often. And it's really hard for me to say because I'm not an engineer. I don't know should how. Be up to you, should <laughs> it should be. Up be. To you. But in my in my in my thinking, it's not just a money question. Mm. It is the fact that we are led to believe that CCTV is being watched live. It is not. Mm -hmm. Could they bring in an AI system that monitors that? Um, why are there no sensors on the tracks? Every car has got a sensor, mm -hmm. but not the tracks. How, how come there's no one, no staff in the stations? Mm -hmm. That why are the basics happen. not done for if somebody falls on the tracks, there should be a training. something in place? Yeah. I mean, presumably there is, perhaps the staff there that night just didn't know, but you feel like that should be such a priority. And the thing is, I'm led to believe that this was a freak accident, an mm. unfortunate series of events, but it's not true. I have since the accidents and since I've spoken publicly about it, received hundreds and hundreds of messages from people who said, oh, this nearly happened to me. And I was lucky that a member of the public fished me mm. out. Mm -hmm. And it's always a member of the public. Mm. And that leads me to the point where change needs to happen. I, I, I didn't sacrifice an arm and a leg for nothing to happen on the back of it. Well, Sarah, you're raising awareness of it and I know that you're going to keep pushing it. Like you said, you made the ultimate sacrifice and you're here to tell the story. You're so fortunate and thank you so much for coming in to talk to us tonight on The UK Tonight. We wish you and your family well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, well, some really um, interesting and important questions raised there. We have had a statement from Transport for London, TfL, uh, from Nick Dent, the Director of Customer Operations at London Underground. They say, our thoughts continue to be with Sarah Delagarde and her family following the devastating incident at High Barnet Station last year. We have offered her direct support through our Sarah Hope Line service and we remain receptive to Sarah's views about the network. Safety is our top priority and we continue to take every possible measure to learn from any incident and put in place appropriate improvements. Now, police in London will no longer be sent out to most mental health calls in the capital. Officers are now only going to be sent to incidents where there is a risk to life or risk of serious harm. The Met Police says that given its officers are not trained to deliver mental health care and those calls are diverting resources away from the prevention of crime, the service is failing Londoners twice. Sky's health correspondent Ashish Joshi has this report. 1244, sorry, what's the age of this male, please? PC Liam Cross and PC Matt Baker are responding to the first call of their shift. There's concern for a patient who's failed to attend a second very important health appointment. They've called us asking us to do a welfare check, so hopefully when we get there, fingers crossed they're present and they are safe and well. The patient isn't at home. Neighbours say they haven't seen him for weeks and are worried about him, especially now that the police are involved. It's more than likely that he is away on holiday. Um, from just speaking with the doctors there, they're going to follow it up again next week give a further phone call. The inconclusive search has taken two hours of their shift. So that's exactly the sort of call that the Met Police will stop responding to. These officers were telling me that sometimes they can spend an entire shift responding to mental health calls alone. The right care, right person policy is designed to free up police time to fight crime and to make sure health professionals deal with health emergencies. It will be rolled out nationwide eventually, but the Met says they will still respond to the most serious cases. Where there is a risk to life, where there's a crime has been committed or where there's a risk of breach of the peace, the police will always still attend. Um, where it's purely a healthcare issue, where we are not the best people to attend, we would want the best people to attend, which are healthcare professionals. The NHS is keen to stress that there will be a phased handover where they will work closely with the police to make sure the new system works. Today what we see is the introduction of um, a shared telephone number where we can give advice to the police about what to do if they feel they've got a person in front of them with a mental health crisis. But there's a real fear that the gap left by the police will mean vulnerable people will be left exposed without Again, proper care. There is concern that that isn't going to be properly funded and there are still some people, notably those people who are feeling at risk of suicide and who go missing, that the police won't 
uh, be called out to. And that is a concern because those are the very most vulnerable people who could fall through the cracks. By the end of PC Cross and PC Baker shift, they and their colleagues were asked to deal with another nine health emergencies. In future, they won't have to, but somebody will. Ashish Joshi, Sky News, North London. Well, earlier I spoke to mental health campaigner John Junior. He has dedicated his life to helping those suffering from mental health crises, having come through his own crisis. And I asked him about the resources available to people looking for help in an emergency, a warning that our conversation does include references to suicide. Well, if you send ambulance services out, they do a welfare check on you. Mm. And they're not trained in crisis training or mental health first aid, so their assessment is more physical than mental. And then they just go away, because I've called them numerous times for people that I work with mm -hmm. that are high risk, and they've just gone away. They need proper training, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, this is the problem w with this, is that, oh, yeah, it's OK, just the ambulance service will deal with it. They can't deal with it, because they're not trained like that. Mm -hmm. They check your welfare, don't get me wrong, they check your welfare but they don't understand the crisis. They don't get that. Mm. And that's the thing here. This is, this is so damaging. Like, it hurts me inside mm. to know that they're going to be changing this policy and they're going to leave all these people, like, in crisis mm. and won't be able to get any help. They'll literally be... Sorry, I can't. I'm getting emotional. No, no, no. No, I completely understand <laughs> yeah. because this is something so, very personal to yeah, you. It is, yeah. And you yeah. two talk it, it, to people it, it, going it, it, through it right now... Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. ..on a daily basis. Yeah. Because you can understand from the police's point of view... This isn't their area of expertise. No, no. Are you of the mindset that perhaps it should be, that actually perhaps police officers should be trained? They shouldn't be removed yeah, 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 from no, no, no. the mental health arena. No. They should be properly trained because they actually have the yeah. power to section people under the Mental Health yeah. Act. Yeah, they do. They have the power to arrest someone in an emergency and they can hold them for 24 hours and then extend it to another 12 hours to take them a place to safety or take them for an assessment. I believe if they can section someone under the Mental Health Act, they can also have first aid training and crisis training to assess that person's need. Mm -hmm. So they're not in A&E for 14, 15 hours, mm -hmm. you know, when they can assess them themselves, you know, and have some kind of a knowledge with that, mm -hmm. and it'll be able to save the crime, you know, save the police number of hours that are spending on people. Your fear is that there's now a gap in the system with the police removed. There's a yeah. gap that vulnerable yeah. people mm -hmm. will fall through. Yeah. If anyone's watching tonight and having a really tough time yeah. and struggling, yeah. what would you say to them? I'd say to them that the mood is temporary. I've been there where you've been before. I felt isolated and trapped and suffocated. And we don't want to die, we just want the feeling to go. Mm. We don't want to die. I've been there where they, where they are feeling trapped and isolated. And you don't want to die, you just want that feeling to go. You just want to talk to someone. And I always advise people to ring Samaritans, mm. which is fantastic, amazing service. And I've rang them numerous of times myself. And they saved my life and they'll be able to save their life too. John, thank you. It's OK. And if you've been affected by anything uh, in that story, you can call the Samaritans on 116123 or email joe at samaritans.org. Coming up on The UK Tonight, we'll have action from six matches in the Carabao Cup tonight, including the London Derby, where this own goal gave Arsenal a bad start at West Ham. And... Dancing Queen, Camilla showing off her moves on the state visit to Kenya. very significant issue. The World Health Organization published a report in 2015 that showed that 1.1 billion people between the ages of 12 and 35 were at risk of avoidable hearing loss. So it's a very major problem, 10, billion, uh, 10 million of them at risk in the UK. So we were designed, if you like, five million years ago to do what we're doing, communicate with each yeah. other. Um, and also to keep ourselves safe, so knowing that the saber-toothed tiger was up there rather than down there. Unfortunately, our hearing hasn't evolved for the le levels of sound that we now experience routinely in our lives. And there are a number of big issues, so going to live events, whether they're sporting or music, um, noisy sports, so motorcycling, things like that, um, but also headphone use is a, is a very serious issue as well. Well, we need to be conscious of the sound exposure that we're getting. So as part of this campaign, which we're launching today, we're lobbying the government to ask them to make sure that headphones provide safeguarding information to the user. 
So provide them with information that they can then use to protect their own hearing. There are two risks. One is the risk of, of hearing loss. So um, I'm actually a sufferer from hearing loss. So my hearing is around 20 years older than I am. Uh, typically, and that's from uh, motorcycling. I used to shoot clay pigeons, and obviously, uh, well, not obviously, but I used to go to a lot of live events. Um, and my hearing is is damaged, so I have tinnitus. That's very unpleasant, and that is a constant sound in your ears, very, very distracting. The other problems are then functioning in social situations. So if you're in a pub or a cafe or somewhere like that, you can't hear the correspondent that you're talking to. But in addition, there's a risk now that's been identified of hearing loss and cognitive decline being correlated. So if you have hearing loss, you're much more likely to suffer from cognitive decline issues. So Alzheimer's and things of that nature. And how do you check your hearing? Go and have a hearing test. The problem is though that the hearing tests generally won't highlight that you've got a hearing problem until you've damaged a significant amount of your hearing already. The better thing to do is to look at things like the applications that are running on your phone. So, for example, Apple have on their phones, a, uh, in the hearing health kit, they have a, a data bank which shows you what your exposure levels are. Please have a look at it. I think you might be unpleasantly surprised about your exposure levels. Uh, coming up on the UK tonight, Dancing Queen will show you Camilla enjoying herself during her state visit to Kenya. But first, Teddy is here with the sport. And we're talking about Ivan Tony out of action for eight months. He was banned for betting, wasn't he? Breaching betting yep. rules. Um, so he probably won't be in action now until January. And he could fetch 100 million. Well, he is prime age uh, for a striker, 27 years of age, but you're absolutely spot on. Won't be available until January the 16th, which, is, of course, is two weeks before the January transfer window ends. If anyone is desperate for a striker, two clubs playing uh, tonight, actually, in fact. We'll get to that in a second. Arsenal and Chelsea apparently interested in him. Scored mm. 20 Premier League goals last season, despite the betting investigation against him. And the yardstick that Brentford are using is that Harry Kane went for £100 million in the summer. <laughs> scored yeah. 10 more goals than Ivan Tony last season, but is three years older, so at 27 years of age, would be a good investment for someone to mm. potentially buy Ivan Tony. He'll have motivation to get back playing. Has played behind closed doors. Is training with Brentford now, but looking at the Euros for England next summer as mm. well, perhaps to be the understudy for Harry Kane, even yeah. compete with it for a spot with him. So it's an interesting subplot. But Brentford apparently have uh, treated potential murmurs of a 50 to 60 million pound offer for Tony in January with derision is the uh, understanding from Sky Sports News. <laughs> so they're looking at the, the big one, 100 million pounds, but uh, not for sale, they say, in January at the, at the earliest. So it will probably be next summer. Yeah, it's the sort of risk versus reward, isn't it? And when you talk about him training, well, playing behind closed doors, in those eight months, what does he do? Is it just training? I mean, psychologically, that must be so boring for, for a professional footballer. Well, incredible. For the first four months, couldn't train, wasn't allowed. And that was actually criticised as part of uh, the FA's punishment, was saying that for four months he couldn't train with Brentford. So yeah. a lot of people said, if you're saying that this person who's reported to have a gambling problem hasn't then got the opportunity to train and keep, keep focused. You don't have to get match fitness back, you've got to get conditioning yeah. back. And they, he scored against Lake Como. There's actually a video on the Sky Sports website in a, a game behind closed doors that doesn't count as an official fixture. But it's going to be a challenge for him to get back and playing after mm. eight months out. So, yeah, if he can hit the ground running, potentially a big summer move, but Brentford will want big money. OK, we'll watch and wait for January. Absolutely. <laughs> 